The STM32 can be set to generate three types of SPI interrupts, the transmit buffer interrupt, the receive buffer interrupt, and the error interrupt. They are easy to set up and really come in handy when the need arises to write code that is non-blocking or the system is battery powered and power consumption must be taken into account. To set them up, the peripheral interrupt needs to be enabled in the nested vector interrupt controller, the interrupt service routine needs to be defined within the project, and the interrupt request generation needs to be enabled for the SPI peripheral. First of all, the interrupt needs to be enabled in the NVIC in order for the interrupt requests generated by the SPI to be serviced by the microcontroller. Without the SPI interrupt enabled, the requests generated by the SPI will simply be ignored. Taking a look at the NVIC table, I am interested in SPI1 interrupt as I will be using SPI1 for the examples. The position of this interrupt in the table is specified to be 35. This value doesn't tell us much until we look at the programming manual. Page 210 of the manual provides a description of the interrupt set enable register which is used to enable the interrupts in the nested vector interrupt controller. Interrupt set enable register 1 is used to enable interrupts 32 to 63 which means that bit 3 of this register is used to enable the SPI1 interrupt. In the project these registers have been implemented as an array where the index specifies the number of the register. I therefore access register 1 and set bit 3 of that register to enable SPI1 interrupt. When the interrupt is generated, a call to an interrupt service routine is made so that the event that caused the interrupt can be handled. Each peripheral has a dedicated interrupt service routine, the names of which can be found in the startup file for the specific microcontroller model being used. I am using the STM32 cube IDE which stores the file under core startup. The file specifies which microcontroller it is for by having the microcontroller model in its name. All the interrupt service routines available to the microcontroller are located under the interrupt service routine vector section. The name of the interrupt handler for SPI1 is specified here to be SPI1 underscore IRQ handler. To make use of this handler, I define it within the project as a void function that takes no parameters. This is because the interrupts are hardware generated and the hardware has no idea what interrupt parameters it would pass, nor would it know where to return data if the interrupt service routine had a return type. The code I add in the interrupt handler will depend on which interrupt I am working with, I therefore have to enable interrupt request generation for at least one of them. All the bits used to enable the specific interrupt requests are located in the SPI control register 2. Let's first consider receive buffer not empty interrupt request generation which is enabled by setting bit 6 of this register. This interrupt request will be generated when the RxNe flag is set. This flag is located in the SPI status register along with the other flags and is set when the receive buffer is not empty. Now what the SPI considers as a not empty receive buffer is dependent on the FRXTH bit which is bit 12 of control register 2. This bit determines the number of bits that have to be shifted into the receive buffer before it is considered not to be empty which in turn causes the RXNE event to be generated which sets the RXNE flag. Both the receive and transmit buffers are 32 bits in size therefore when this bit is cleared the RXNE event will be generated when the buffer is half full that is, when at least 16 bits have been shifted into it. When set, the event is generated when a quarter of the buffer is full, or in other words, when at least 8 bits have been shifted in. What this bit is set to will depend on the size of the data frames being transacted. For example, in this tutorial I am working with 16-bit data frames, so I want the RxNe flag to be set only when the whole 16 bits are shifted into the receive buffer, therefore I will want to keep this bit set to 0. So, I will access control register 2 and first clear bit 12 so that the RxNe event is generated only when a full 16-bit data frame is shifted into the buffer. I will then go ahead and also set bit 6 of this register in order to enable the interrupt request generation for the receive buffer. So to summarize the process of interrupt generation. When enough bits have been shifted into the receive buffer during a transaction, this causes the RxNe event to be generated. The RxNe event causes the RxNe flag to be set, which triggers an interrupt request to be generated, causing the processor to jump into the interrupt service routine. 
It is in this interrupt service routine that work will have to be done to complete the transaction. Therefore, let's see how to implement communication over SPI with this interrupt setup. To keep this video on topic, the rest of the registers required to get the SPI up and running have been configured. Here I will only be demonstrating how to write code that utilizes interrupts to communicate over SPI. To learn how to write an SPI driver, check out my other video where I cover this topic in detail. Anyway, to understand how to implement communication over SPI with the receive buffer not empty interrupt enabled, it is worth seeing how it is implemented without any interrupts. For example, this is the function I use to communicate without interrupts. This function was written to communicate with the MPU9250 specifically as I am extracting data from this device for demonstration purposes. Because of this, there are some specifics such as the fact that I use 16-bit transactions and also have to do some data manipulation before I transmit and read data in order to get useful information out of the device. These specifics are irrelevant to the topic, but since I am using this function as an example, pointing this out hopefully provides some clarity. Anyway, to summarize the communication process, the function takes a parameter which is the data I'm going to transmit over SPI. I initiated the transaction by lowering the slave select. I then write the data to be transmitted into the data register which transfers the data to the transmit buffer. After that, I pull the status register until the SPI is not busy and the data has been shifted into the receive buffer. I then read from the data register which grabs the data from the receive buffer and saves it into the Rx data variable. I finally end the transaction by setting the slave select high and return the data extracted. This method of polling the status register is inefficient in terms of power usage as well as processing. The reason for this is that the processor usually runs at a much higher frequency than the SPI peripheral, which means that all these clock cycles spent checking if the transaction has completed could be used for other purposes such as handling some other peripheral or some other processing task or the processor could be put to sleep to conserve power while waiting for the transaction to complete. These things become significant when using the microcontroller in more complex real-time applications where it needs to handle many other devices in a timely manner or when power consumption of the microcontroller becomes something to take into account because it has to be powered by a battery and it has to last days on a single charge. Therefore this is where the interrupts become very useful as they allow the microcontroller to allocate the processing resource somewhere else or simply go to sleep to conserve energy while the transaction is being carried out and when enough data is shifted into the buffer, the SPI peripheral will interrupt the processor so that it can handle that event. Therefore the interrupt will replace the polling loop. So to re-implement the function to work with the interrupt, I'm going to split this function into two parts. The first part involves transmitting the data over the SPI. I create a function called transmit SPI that takes a byte as a parameter, just like the example function. I then copy these two statements from the example function to initiate the transaction and write the data into the data register for transmission. The second part involves adding code to the interrupt handler. Once the interrupt is generated and the processor branches to the interrupt service routine, one of the things that must be done is prevent the interrupt request from being generated again. Otherwise the interrupt request will continue being generated, causing the microcontroller to get stuck in the interrupt handler. One of the ways of stopping the interrupt request from being regenerated is to clear the RxNE flag which when set causes the interrupt request to be generated. This flag is automatically cleared by hardware when the buffer is considered empty. Since read accesses to the data register shift the received data out of the received buffer, this action will cause the RxNE flag to clear. I will begin by declaring a global variable called data received that will hold data read from the received buffer. It is a global variable because the read will be performed from within the interrupt handler which does not return any data meaning that the data would be lost otherwise. Then in the same manner as was done in the example function, I will read the data from the receive buffer and save a byte into the variable and then set the slave select high to end the transaction. As mentioned earlier, the read operation will empty the receive buffer which will cause the RxNe flag to clear which means that the interrupt request will stop being generated by the SPI peripheral. I will also declare another variable called new data which will act as a flag to indicate that the data has been extracted from the SPI and I set this flag in the interrupt handler right after the slave select has been set high. 
In main, I declare the work done counter variable that I will use as a basic indicator that the processor actually does something while the SPI is busy transmitting data. And I also call my init SPI function to initialize the SPI, which includes the function that I wrote earlier to set up the interrupt. Inside the while loop, I call the transmit SPI function to initiate the transaction and load data for transmission. Next I create a while loop which will terminate once the new data flag is set within the interrupt handler. Inside this loop I will increment the work done counter to show the non-blocking nature of an interrupt. In reality, the processor time can be used for more useful things like processing the data from the previous transaction, however this is not the focus of this video, so I won't do it here. Once out of the loop I clear the new data flag and then reset the work done counter to restart the process. With this done, the code is now ready. To test it out, I will place two breakpoints. The first one at the end of the interrupt service routine and the second one just before the work done counter is reset. After building and uploading the code, I inspect the SPI pins on my oscilloscope and can see that the SPI is transmitting and receiving data, which means that the code works as expected. I then launch the debugger and press the continue button until the breakpoint is reached. The first breakpoint reached is the one placed inside the interrupt handler, which means that the interrupt was successfully generated. Taking a look at the variables I have added to the watch, you can see that the new data flag was set and data read from the receive buffer. Pressing the continue button again takes us to the next breakpoint. Here you can see that we have now been taken out of the loop since the flag was set. Inspecting the watch again, you can now see that the work done counter reached a value that is non-zero, which shows that the processor was able to do some overwork while the transmission was ongoing. You can also see that the new data flag was reset, which will put us back in the loop on another iteration. Moving on to the transmit buffer empty interrupt, this interrupt is enabled by setting bit 7 of control register 2 and is generated when the TXE flag is set. Bit 1 of the status register states that the flag is set when the transmit buffer is considered empty. The SPI considers its 32-bit transmit buffer empty when it has enough space to store data to send, which in this case means that the flag will be set when the buffer is only half empty, as I am working with 16-bit data. This kind of interrupt is therefore suitable for situations where the microcontroller needs to continuously send data or when the microcontroller itself acts as a slave to other devices and it needs to have data ready to transmit back to the master. To demonstrate how this interrupt can be used, I will continuously send data over the SPI. In the project, I enable the interrupt request generation for this one by writing to control register 2 and setting bit 7. As mentioned earlier, this time the interrupt will be generated when the transmit buffer has space available to be filled with data to transmit. As with the receive buffer not empty interrupt and the RX NE flag, the TXC flag has to be cleared to stop the interrupt from being regenerated. This flag is automatically cleared by hardware when the available space in the transmit buffer is filled with data. So in the interrupt handler I have to transfer a 16-bit data frame into the transmit buffer. I first declare a global variable called data to transmit that I will load the data into outside of the interrupt handler while the transmission of data is ongoing. Inside of the interrupt handler, I will fill the transmit buffer by writing the content of the data to transmit variable into the data register in the same manner as was done in the example function described earlier. I will then use a while loop to shift all the data out of the receive buffer. There are two reasons for this. The first is that there will be data ready to be read as data is shifted into the receive buffer while data in the transmit buffer is being shifted out. This data could be saved and processed outside of the interrupt handler but I simply discard the data as it's not relevant to this example. This brings me on to the second reason which is that if you are not planning to use the data like me in this example and you don't empty the receive buffer an overrun error will occur. The error occurs when the receive buffer does not have space to store the received data, subsequently causing the data to be discarded, which results in data loss. This has no impact if there is no interest in the data, but it's something to be aware of and good practice to not introduce errors unwittingly. Next I declare a global variable called data loaded to function as a flag to indicate that the data has been written into the transmit buffer. I then set this flag in the interrupt handler after the receive buffer has been emptied. In main, I initialize the SPI, but this time I set the slave select low first and then configure the interrupt. 
The reason behind this is that I have the slave select of the SPI configured to be controlled by software, which means that I have to manually set the slave select low to initiate the transaction. Now because the operation of the SPI is independent of the state of the slave select, if I configure the interrupt and enable the SPI before setting the slave select low, the interrupt would be generated to fill the transmit buffer as it's initially empty, causing the transmission of data to go ahead which would violate the SPI's communication format. Because in this example I continuously transmit data, I will just keep the slave select low. I also chose not to preload the transmit buffer with any data, because once the interrupt is enabled, the interrupt request will be generated, causing the processor to branch to the interrupt serves routine inside which the transmit buffer would be filled. The interrupt would be generated twice because the TXC flag would only clear if more than one half of the buffer was filled. Since I am filling the buffer with 16-bit data frames and it's 32 bits wide, the buffer would be completely full when the interrupt is generated the second time. In the while loop, as data transmission is in progress, before doing any work, I check if the data loaded flag is set. If it is, I will prepare some data for transmission and save it into the data to transmit variable, which I use when writing data to transmit into the data register as shown earlier. I then clear the data loaded flag. After that, if I had any data I wanted to process, I could process it at this point or simply put the microcontroller to sleep to conserve power until the interrupt is regenerated. So after building and uploading the code onto the board, I inspect the SPI lines using my oscilloscope and can see that the data I loaded into the transmit buffer is being transmitted on the master out slave inline. The MPU9250 didn't take too kindly to continuous transmission so there is no data transmitted back but nevertheless I can confirm that this code works as intended. Moving on to the error interrupt. This interrupt is enabled by setting bit 5 in control register 2 and will be generated when an SPA related error occurs. There are four errors on which the interrupt request will be generated with one of them being the overrun error described earlier. I will use this error to provide an example. So the interrupt request will be generated for this type of error when the overrun flag is set by the SPI. Clearing the overrun flag is a bit more involved, as a read needs to be performed on the data register followed by a read on the status register. This makes sense as leaving the receive buffer full would result in the error occurring on the next transaction. And again, this flag has to be cleared, otherwise the interrupt will be regenerated, which will result in the processor not being able to branch back to what it was doing before the interrupt occurred. This interrupt is good for catching errors, especially when it cannot be guaranteed that the microcontroller will be able to handle the communication. To demonstrate how this interrupt works, I will force the over an error to occur in the code, but first in the project I will enable this interrupt by setting bit 5 in control register 2. In the interrupt handler I will first clear the overrun error flag by performing a read operation on the data register and then a read on the status register as stated in the reference manual. In main I will have the SPI initialized with the interrupt inside my init SPI function once again and I will then set the slave select low to initiate the transaction. Now in the while loop I will force the error by continuously transmitting data but not reading anything from the receive buffer in order to fill it up. I do this by waiting until the transmit buffer empty flag is set in the status register and then writing some data into the data register. Since I want to continuously transmit the data to fill the receive buffer, I don't bother setting the slave select high between transactions. Before uploading onto the microcontroller, I'll place a breakpoint inside the interrupt handler to see if the interrupt will be generated as expected. After uploading the code and starting the debugger, I press continue to let the code run until the breakpoint is reached. As you can see, the breakpoint has been reached, which means that the interrupt was generated when the overrun error flag was set. Now if I step through the code, the error flag will clear and the processor will jump back to main and continue transmitting more data until the interrupt is generated again. So these were the free interrupts available to the SPI. If you found this video helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a like, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.